That is the book of James, first chapter, starting with the 26th verse. And if you could please stand when you have it. Hear ye the word of the Lord. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to take care of orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. God's word for God's people and God's people said amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, for the time that we're going to spend together, I want to talk about True religion. True religion. <clears throat> the book of James is written by James, the brother of Jesus. I can only imagine what it's like growing up with Jesus as your brother. I mean, you know, siblings tend to compare themselves to one another regardless of the age uh, 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 that they're apart. And there may be a little bit of a competition, but uh, (laughs) where there's a clear (laughs) difference, I can only imagine how that works. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, when I was in daycare. There was a uh, young man by the name of Rico, and Rico pretty much said whatever Rico wanted to say to the rest of the students in daycare. Rico and I actually got into a bit of a disagreement because I was not going to let Rico talk to me any kind of way. And one of the other students was like, don't mess with Rico. And I said, why not? Rico is messing with me. And uh, I imagine it was not as eloquent as I'm giving it right now because I had to still be in elementary school, maybe early middle school at the time. But yes, they were telling me, you know, don't mess with Rico. And they finally told me why you don't mess with Rico because Rico had two older brothers by the name of Paul and Ole Redman. This is not the same Paul that I ended up getting in trouble with Oh, we're not getting in trouble with, but who got himself into trouble with the murder case years later. But this was a different Paul, but Paul and Ole Redman, and they had a cousin named Rodney Smith. And they were all the best fighters in the neighborhood, hands down. And so messing with Rico um, would would lead way to a fight with Paul or his older brother, uh, Ole, or his cousin, Rodney. Now, I ended up having to have a conversation with Paul Redman uh, because Paul came by to uh, walk his uh, little brother home from daycare and uh, we, we, we settled our differences. <clears throat> but uh, I do remember that Rico had this confidence. Rico could say whatever he wanted to say because he knew his brother would be there To back him up. And I I sort of imagine that because a lot of James's language, even in the Greek, is harsh. It's direct. Uh, This is worthless. This is what you need to be doing. Uh, This is how you are supposed to be carrying out things. He didn't go into what they would call uh, in in seminary a philosophical diatribe. It wasn't long and eloquent. It wasn't a Socratic method to how he went about his approach. It wasn't very... Uh, learn it. Not that he wasn't learned it, but he just didn't, when he had something to say about this thing that we have called Christianity, he said what was on his mind. That's why he said, if you don't bridle your tongue, your religion is worthless, because he could say that. He could also say that because he was living with Jesus, and this was more than something he did. This was a way of life. Some of the things that he said, he was quoting because he was there. The Gospels had not been written yet. Some of the epistles had not been written yet. He was talking about his 
intimate, true relationship with the Christ. He didn't rely upon another pastor, a bishop, a district superintendent, a chief prelate, apostle, primate, bishop designate. No, 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 none of those titles. He had a relationship with Jesus. And so that's where he spoke from was the first hand knowledge, the relationship that he built talking to his brother. He wasn't concerned about VBS or Sunday school or did he go to church or, you know, what ministry he was president of or anything like that. No, he was about living this way of life. It was more than just a conversation to him, more than a T-shirt. It was how he did things. It was there was no way out of it. He was about that life. You know, people often say that the Bible uh, contradicts itself. And uh, I won't get into the specific details of that now. But, you know, often one of the examples that they put is about James versus the Apostle Paul. Because James said that faith without works is dead. And the Apostle Paul said that we are justified by faith. And so people will say, well, this is a faith against works argument in uh, the Apostle Paul. And then there is a, well, do the works without because faith without works is dead. And they don't really contradict each other. When you get into the context that it was in, they were talking about two different things. James, when he's talking about faith versus works, in the context that he uses it, there is... um, He is talking about monotheism. There are people that he's dealing with at the time that believe in God, but that's about it. They say, I have faith. I believe in God. I go to church. That should be enough. But they're not doing anything about their belief. Superman came out of the booth to help the people. He didn't stay in the booth. And so he said, they say, when they talk about faith there, he said, I believe in God. And that's it. That should be enough. I'm doing my thing. And when he talks about works, he's saying you got to get out and do things. And when the Apostle Paul is talking about faith, he's talking about belief in what's called the Christ event. The crucified, died and buried and rose from the dead. And when he's talking about works, he's talking about people who have taken a legalistic view of everything and, you know, don't want to don't want to do anything wrong to break the law. Two different kinds of faith. One is believing in Jesus and doing that, and the other is believing in God. So they're not talking about the exact same thing when they talk about faith versus work. James is saying, I believe in God. You say, I believe in God, but you believe in God. What else? What else do you do? That's it? You just go to church? That's all? Or you just believe? And and Apostle Paul is saying you got to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, that Jesus was crucified and died for your sins. And the work that you all are doing is kind of to show everybody, hey, look at what I'm doing. Or, hey, look at how many laws I've memorized. I wrote them on my eyelids so that even when I sleep, I'm looking at them. (laughs) I got them on my arms and I have them all over my clothes. And so it's two different faith versus works in the sense. So they don't contradict each other in context. They're talking about two different things. And that's what James is talking about when he's saying that uh, I need you to do a little bit more than just believe in God. I need you to do a little bit more than just have a monotheistic religion and kind of say that should be enough. That's, that's it. I need you to do a little bit more. And he says to uh, my brothers and sisters, he's writing to believers who are not able to get to the central city of Jerusalem. They're spread out. They've lost their homes. They have uh, had to live in the outskirts. And he's writing to them, the people who may not feel like they are welcome in the big city with the nice bloodlines and the things of that nature, the diaspora, the people who have been separated from the rest of the community. And he says to count it. Whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Because you know that the testing of your faith 
produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so you may be mature and complete and lacking nothing. When you are going through a situation, you ought not complain about the situation. Consider it joy because it's going to make you stronger. You'll be able to look at a situation and be able to get over it because I've been through worse. I remember going through a couple of situations trying to get some paperwork taken care of in certain events. And people would say, I lost the paperwork. I lost this and that. But I had attended Prairie View A&M University. So I knew what it was like and I knew how to prepare for people who say they didn't get the paperwork or say I didn't turn it in on time or say that they had lost it or say this. That's okay. I have copies. Here you go. Here's the paperwork you need so I can get this business deal taken care of or I can get registered for this, that, or other because I went through something a little bit harder. I've had people lose my paperwork and try to drop me from the roll or try to get me to sign a release to, to, so I would lose housing. I've been through that. You know, I've, I've been to, on the yard my senior year and they uh, say that we accidentally took more deposits than uh, we actually had rooms for. So if you just sign this little release, we're going to take care. But I've been through that and I know that if I would have signed that release, they wouldn't have been obligated to provide me housing. But because I didn't sign the release, they had to put me in a hotel prior to I'd been through something worse. And because I'd been through something worse, I knew when that trial came, it made me stronger. It made me mature. I didn't have to go out and scream and fuss at people and, you know, try to be in trouble or anything or call people. No, I know I've been through this. This is nothing. You have to have resistance. That's why muscles grow. Muscles don't grow by not being used. Muscles grow by putting on resistance. You have to put something against them. You have to push against something in order for the muscle to grow. So the trials make you stronger. And I like that in the Greek, uh, the temptation, the word temptation that is used, and the word trial and test, all of that's the same word. The only difference is one is internal and one is external. But they're there to test what you've learned. I can go to class all day, take good notes, participate in class, but I will have to be tested to verify what I know. And that is what is going on when he says it. And, and, and the maturity is reflected by your patience in the struggle. If you ever had any family problem, when you have a family problem again, you're able to work your way through it. If you had a financial problem, you're able to work your way through it. If you've had any kind of problem, just not getting along with somebody, you'll be able to work your way through it because you've developed a maturity. And not, in, and, and not a maturity in, in the sense of uh, that someone who doesn't or has not been through a struggle is childish, but it's a maturity from a form of experience. I uh, watch a lot of musicians, and I can tell a young drummer from an old drummer. Even when I was playing drums, I could tell when there was a young drummer on the, screen, on the scene and there was a, a new drummer, a, 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 I mean a seasoned drummer, Seasoned drummers stay in what's called the pocket. They keep the beat. And after they keep the beat, they keep the rhythm because the rest of the, the, rest of the band has to depend upon them. So they stay in the pocket and they'll do a trick every now and then as icing on the cake. But a young drummer is going to show every trick they got all over the place showing you every move that they got, throwing sticks up and down, catching them, standing up, catching the cymbals, stopping. But they're going to burn energy. They won't get called to do the two-and-a-half-hour concert because they burned all their energy on that first song. There's a maturity to the experience. There's a maturity of going through some things and understanding what's going on and you'll be able to conserve the energy and keep the pocket and get called for the big time. Amen. So you count it joy when you're facing trials. And if you are lacking anything, he says, ask God. 
I think about asking, it shall be given to you. Seeking, you shall find. Knocking, the door shall be open. Anything you want. And I like that he puts wisdom there because wisdom is an important thing. I would rather know how to do something sometimes than be able to pay somebody else to do it. Wisdom. And the, and the commentaries have even said that he puts it right on the, that is the, the focal question or the focal request of prayer. And it all comes from God. So if you need wisdom in anything, you ask God for that help because it comes from him. And it centralizes prayer. You know, I had to check myself recently. I um, am going through a bit of a situation and uh, there's a, my company that I work for is uh, shutting down. And so uh, I was looking at what I was saying to people as I was a what you call a bivocational pastor, meaning I work a full time job and preach. But uh, as that piece was going down, I had to think about something. And I was telling people as I was networking and looking for another place, you know, hey, this is what happened to the company. This is what's going on. This is what's happening, et cetera. And, and I saw a poster. And the poster said, have you tried praying about your problem as much as you talk about it? I had to really think about that. I mean, yes, I'm explaining the situation, but I had to be con I was convicted by that because no, I was just telling people what was going on and I should try I, not that I had not prayed about it, but if you were to put it on a scale how often I had talked about it versus how often I had prayed about it. I only prayed one time, maybe two. And then kept it moving and then but praying about the situation as much as you talk about it will be able to ease that anxiety. Blood pressure has never been lower. Right. Never been lower. It's 102 over 72. And it used to, I've, and I've been in the hospital with a 220 over 180. So it's never been lower than it has because I had to change how I thought about the situation. I had to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And continue to pray about it. And the more I prayed about it, the lower my blood pressure got about it. Yeah. And then while we were in a seminar, uh, on the last couple of days of job uh, of the job, you know, they were teaching us what we need to do in order to look for a job. The, they came around the table and said, I want to know what everybody's frustrated about. He got to me, the seminar person got to me and I started laughing because I said, I'm not frustrated about anything. <laughs> Praying about a problem as much as you want to talk about it. I'm a living testimony. It's, it will lower the level. It will help you sleep at night. When It'll help you get out the bed when you're supposed to, when somebody else in your situation will have just turned over and been depressed about it. Try praying about it as much as you want to talk about it and see how it works for you. And he goes on to say, blessed is anyone who endures temptation such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Again, temptation, test, trial, same word in the Greek. Just one is external. The test is external. The temptation is internal. It says no one to say that I am tempted by God. Yes, we may go through situations, but it is not wise to say that I am being tempted by God in that situation because you can't really say with certainty that that's what's happening, especially when it comes to temptation. You develop your own desires for temptation, and that's an internal struggle, not an external. That's why it says no one should say when tempted, I am being tempted by God. That's on your own. What you like and versus what you, what you don't like is an internal struggle. You can't blame every problem you go, you, you, you get on God. You know, I could say, God is putting me through a test because I have a few extra pounds on me that I don't need to have. But was it God 
that ordered the double quarter pounder with cheese value meal and the large high C with the hot and spicy chicken and the McDouble no onion and the fruit and yogurt parfait. I can't blame that on God. Not at once, mama. Not at all. Just, just, it's bad food. Recently. You can't blame everything on God. If, if you're getting into a fight with somebody every time you see them, God is not making you fight that person. Some of that is ourselves. You know, I remember when I first five years ago got involved in the ministry candidacy process. Well, it was a little longer than that now. I might be on seven. But one of the first classes I went to, uh, Pastor Robert Johnson was over the class and he said, you know, a lot of people try to blame things on God that God ain't got nothing to do with, let alone would even care about. But you're trying to blame that situation on God and trying to worry about it. And temptation is one of them. We want to blame the fact that we are going through a struggle on God. Now, God can get the glory out of the struggle, but sometimes we put ourselves into that struggle. So no one can say that I am tempted by God. I'm, I'm going through a Job trial. I'm, I'm going, you know, Job was blameless when he went through his trial. So unless we are blameless before the trial comes on, we can't really say we're going through a Job trial. I'm just saying. We get tempted by our own desires. And it says that every generous act of giving, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, for whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. I like that verse. I often pray this verse when I open up prayers, picked it up from my mama, but every good and perfect gift that comes from above, Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. We are nothing without our Lord and Savior. Every good and perfect gift that he continues to give us, it comes from him. Everything. We are nothing without him. There, and there is no variation. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And as long as it's a yesterday, today, and tomorrow going on, he will continue to be the same. And continue to give us every good and perfect gift. We are nothing without him. Nothing at all. What is man that he is mindful of us? That he hears us when we call. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. And he says that you must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Mm. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. It's often said that we have two ears and one mouth. So we ought to do twice as much listening as we do talking. And I've heard a lot of different (laughs) excuses. Well, I got to say what's on my mind. I can't just hold it in. I got to do this. I'm feeling like something's going to happen. I heard one person say, I feel like I'm going to explode if I don't tell them about themselves. I would like to see that. (laughs) Flying off the handle every time you get a chance is not productive. It does not produce God's righteousness. One of my uh, mentors uh, Thomas Walker was going to the airport one day, and this was pre-9-11. 
uh, pre extra security checks, pre everything. And, and so, you know, you normally supposed to just walk in during that time, walk in, drop your bags off and go on and get on the plane. And he ran into some trouble on the uh, trying to get on the plane. The paperwork was missing. A few other things were gone. And uh, under normal circumstances, well, I don't know if it's necessarily considered normal, but other people under that circumstance would have cussed the people out. And I recall that uh, they asked him after everything got situated, what's your profession, Mr. Walker? He said, I'm a pastor. And somebody in the back was saying, I told you, I told you, I told you, I knew he was a pastor. <laughs> Just going, you know, running around celebrating. Hey, I told him, I told him, I told him. And they say that must be, a, that must be why you kept your peace during this situation. You never know. Who's watching? I often say you preach more sermons than I ever will in the pulpit. And it goes to me because I'll preach more sermons than I ever will in the pulpit. People are always watching. And if you are quick to speak, if you are quick to go off the handle and give some unpastorly words or some unchristian words, that's a sermon you just preached. That person you just cussed out, that was a sermon you just preached. And so they may be surprised to find that you go to church. <laughs> or not. Because we, we, we have that. Let's not, let's not uh, pretend like that does not happen as well. There are people who love Jesus but don't love the church. There are a lot of people that hurt from something that somebody told them at a church. Church hurt is the worst hurt to get over. Because you come and you come and you're vulnerable and you pour your heart out and they hurt you when you don't expect to be hurt. That's why we should always be quick to listen and slow to speak. You should also be quick to listen because the more you listen, the more information you'll get. And you may find out some crucial piece of information that will keep you from doing something disastrously. And if you're quick to listen and you're slow to speak, You'll be slow to anger. We also must be doers of the word and not hearers. I noticed when I was going through uh, verses 19 and uh, 19 through 22 in the chapter, it talks about some of the bad things you do. You, you, you hear the word and you don't do it. It's a bit of a self-deception. And I noticed all the bad things that it mentioned. But I noticed when it said to the good things, it, 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 meant, it didn't mention speech. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourself of all sordidness, and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your soul. I noticed that it said to rid yourself of weakness, uh, wickedness and welcome meekness. It didn't say welcome good speech. It didn't say go out and say good things about yourself or about somebody else. Yes, we are to exhort people, but I find it interesting that that piece was missing. More about doing. Don't say bad, but don't constantly pat yourself on the back about your good either. You do the good, you don't need to tell everybody the good that you're doing. It's nice to go to a homeless shelter and pass out clothes and everything, but you ain't got to tell the world. That's what you did. God who sees you in secret will reward you openly. But if you want to shine the light on yourself, you can't buy a light big enough that will shine bright enough than a light that God will shine on you. So when it's time for your promotion, the Lord will see fit for your promotion. And we have to be doers of the word and not hearers. Only what you do for Christ will last. You can do a lot of other things for a lot of other people. But it'll be forgotten about 
in the next news cycle. You got about 20, you do something big, you got about 24 hours. Everybody, Jay, look at what you did. But that's it. But you do something for Jesus. You save a soul. You can also save, that, that also leads to the souls that they may save. So almost a pay it forward effect. It, it's long lasting. The only thing you do for Christ will last. We talk about a lot of good people. A lot of good people in their times have done a lot of good things. But we are still talking about a man that hung on the cross and died for our sins thousands of years ago so that we may be saved. Only what you do for Christ will last. And if anyone thinks they're religious and does not bridle their tongue, you can't talk to people any kind of way. You have to watch. And I went now because I'm not much of a horseback rider. I went to look and see what a bridle was. I had no idea that a bridle was that complicated. And they had names for every piece. They had a name for the piece that covered the ears and a name for the piece that controlled the head and a name for the piece that you put in your mouth, the bit, the bridle, a part to cover the ears and hide hide the head and stir the mouth. And a bridle is used to direct a horse. And that tells me that bridling your tongue might be a lot more complicated than you think. There's a part that covers the ears. What are you letting into your ears? There's a part that steers the head. What am I looking at? What am I focused on? Bridling the tongue, controlling the mouth. And learning a lot of church language as well can be deceiving. You can say all the right things, but only think about God for about an hour to an hour and a half on a Sunday service. What you say is hard to get back. I'm reminded of a story where a woman went to one of our church fathers, St. Francis of Assisi, and said she wanted to confess her sin of gossiping. And what should she do for penance? And so St. Francis told her, take a pile of feathers and put these feathers on the doorstep of every person you talked about. So she went and did it and went back to St. Francis of Assisi. And St. Francis, after she she said, St. Francis, I'll I'll put the feathers on everybody's door. And she said, or well, St. Francis said, all right, then now go pick them back up. And she started going to the houses and the feathers were no longer at the houses where she dropped them. They had spread all over town. And she finally said, she went back to St. Francis and said, I can't pick them up. They've spread out too far. And she said, and St. Francis told her that is what gossip is like. You let it out. It's hard to get it back in. It's easy to say you didn't mean what you said. But the consequences of what you said, the consequences of what you planted out, still spread, even though you did not mean to say it. You have to bridle your tongue. You have to control what you say to people. You have to say what you mean and mean what you said. You have to control the tongue and it's complicated just like a bridle is complicated it's going to be complicated to bridle your tongue but how you talk to people how you treat people is a representation of the God of your salvation it says that religion is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The way you treat 
those who are considered the least among you is a reflection of your relationship with God. Widows and orphans in that time, it was a man-based economy. So a child without a father or a wife without a husband, it was very, very, very hard for them to earn money. So it became the church's responsibility. That, that was their mission to take care of those who could not take care of themselves. It was their mission to speak for those who could not speak for themselves. Because Jesus, while we were yet sinners, came and paid a price we couldn't pay. He lived a life we could not live. He died a death we could not die. He became the perfect sacrifice for us. He took our sins upon his own and paid the price for us. You know, we have these, these churches that have these very complicated mission statements and vision statements with these big old words about them and multi-syllabic descriptions about all that they do. But some of the most effective churches I've seen have had some of the most simple mission statements, the most simple focus. And I've come to understand that if we are not incorporating Matthew 28, 16 through 20, and Matthew 25, 31 through 46, and James 1, 26 and 27 into what we do, we might as well close up shop. We can do something else on Sundays. It's a golf course right across uh, 35. I've been meaning to want to get out there and work on my – keep the elbow locked in, work on my putt game, knock a few holes around. But, no, we got to incorporate that into what we do as a church. Matthew 25. 31 through 46 says when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels are with him and he will sit on his throne of glory and all the nations gather before him. He will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats and he'll put the sheep at the right hand and the goats at the left. And then the king will say those on his right hand come that you are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now watch this. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when was it that you, we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? It was when you saw, we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing. And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer to them. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Matthew 28, 16 says this. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything 
I have commanded and remember to I, I am with you always to the end of an age. If we are not out there treating the least among us, that could be the person at school you don't get along with. That could be the person at school that's not as popular. That could be the person you work with that's not as popular. That could be the person you walk by on a regular basis to and don't speak. The least anybody, anywhere. If you are not treating the least of them like that, if you are not going out and making disciples, really need to look at why we are doing this. If a church is not doing that, it ought to shut its doors. It's taking up space. It's an edifice that is not a church. Now you can come up with a bunch of different ways to say it. You can come up with a bunch of long, drawn out, masterful words and have a two page long mission statement. But it's very clear in these verses what we are supposed to do. It's very clear in James what true religion is. And that is what we ought to do. Because Jesus did it for us. He did not have to die for our sins. He did not have to live a life that lived no, that knew no sin. He did not have to sacrifice himself for us while we were still sinners. But he knew and willingly did it. Scarcely would one die for a good man. A good man. And in our wretched state, he still paid the price for us so that we may have life and have it more abundantly that we may go on and tell others of his works so that they might be saved in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit the doors of the church are open